Our next speaker is Professor Daniel Austin uh, from uh, Brigham, uh, Brigham Young University, and uh, his uh, his talk is going to about uh, converging iron traps for mini mass bag. Daniel. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here. This is a great opportunity to tell you about some of the recent work that we've done. Uh, I'll be talking about converging ion traps for miniaturized mass spectrometry. Uh, as Professor Cooks indicated, uh, sometimes you're interested in barely adequate mass spectrometry, and sometimes uh, you want more than that. Uh, I suppose the trade-off uh, has to do with your application. But mass spectrometry starts out as being a very powerful technique. Uh, partly because of the, the uh, incredible selectivity, the, the wide range of analytes that can be studied. Uh, it's a very sensitive technique, has a very good dynamic range, and, uh, and can be used for quantitation with, a, with a fair accuracy. Um, we don't want to lose too many of these things as we, as we look for trade-offs to get something that's portable, something that will be uh, fast, easy to use, inexpensive, rugged in case you drop it in the field, and small enough that you can get it somewhere useful. Uh, so we have this set of trade-offs. Um, there are a lot of tricks that have been uh, developed. Maybe tricks isn't the right word. A lot of techniques that have been developed to improve the selectivity rather than having just mass spectrometry alone. Um, maybe you don't have high, re high mass resolution. Uh, but other things such as uh, using tandem analysis, which is going to be particularly important if you're looking at unknown compounds in the field and you need to find out what what these compounds are, or looking at uh, complex mixtures, uh, that gives you additional selectivity. Um, there are techniques for doing selective preconcentration, uh, selective ionization. Again, this is just adding to the, the features of, of, of the mass spectrometer, and it's going to be very valuable as we try to make these things smaller without losing performance too much. Uh, and of course, the ultimate in selectivity would be to uh, use the mass spectrometer as part of a GCMS or an LCMS instrument. Uh, which allows you to separate fairly complex systems before it even gets to the mass spectrometer. Um, we, we want to take something that's very powerful and make it miniaturized and portable so we can take it out into the field and to, to samples that are uh, difficult to, uh, with difficult accessibility, but we don't want to lose the benefits of the technique, otherwise we lose the advantage of using that technique in the first place. So... Um, I think we're hearing only about ion traps this afternoon, but uh, there are other mass analyzers. Uh, I'm not going to talk about them either. Uh, just to point out that the ion traps are not the only way to do this, but there are a lot of inherent advantages of using ion traps. Uh, first of all, they're already geometrically compact. They're already fairly small compared with other mass analyzers. They already have a higher tolerance to pressure. Uh, they are fast enough, they, they scan through the mass range fast enough that they can uh, cover several points in a GC peak or, or an LC peak, and so they're, they're amenable to, uh, to including with those, with those techniques. Um, it's, it's readily straightforward to do tandem mass spectrometry with an ion trap. You don't have to have multiple mass analyzers to do that. Uh, the sensitivity of ion traps is very good. Uh, they, have, they have good mass resolution. It's not as good as some other techniques, but... Uh, for most applications, it's good enough. And there's a favorable scaling. Um, the, the voltage and frequency uh, don't get too out of control as we try to make these smaller. So with all those advantages, uh, there are a few challenges uh, that I've noted here. As we, as we make an ion trap smaller, we're, we're taking essentially a, a volume in which we are trapping ions and reducing the size of that volume. We may also be reducing the electric field, and so the, the, uh, the ions themselves, which have to be trapped by that field, uh, have, have to be contained in a smaller volume with a smaller field, and you can't contain as many ions as you do that. As we lose the number of ions that we're trapping, we may be losing sensitivity or losing dynamic range um, or losing the speed of analysis. I guess we could always uh, trap over and over and over again and make up for this, but, but we don't want to take too long either. Otherwise, we, we uh, lose some of the portability of it. So there is the, the, uh, the challenge of keeping enough ions uh, to be analytically useful. And two approaches that people have used to, lo to look at this, uh, one is to use arrays of traps, and Dr. Cooks, Cooks, Dr. Cooks showed some examples of this uh, with arrays of uh, rectilinear ion traps. Uh, another option is to use traps that have extended trapping dimensions. 
So in the conventional quadruple ion trap, ions are confined to a very small region, essentially a little spheroid region at the center of the trap. Uh, whereas in, in a, a trap such as a, a linear or rectilinear trap, ions are spread out into a larger volume, and that allows you to, to uh, contain more ions in your trap. The second uh, challenge is the accuracy of the electric field shape. We, we, the uh, ions are responding to very precisely shaped electric fields, and if we deviate from those shapes or if we can't reproduce them accurately with small machining, uh, we lose out on some of our mass accuracy or resolution. Uh, and it turns out that this, uh, this accuracy, accuracy of field shape issue is, is also a challenge with, with using arrays or with traps that have extended trapping dimensions. Let me give you an example of that. This would be a linear ion trap, or at least the, the uh, central four electrodes of that. So uh, imagine we have these four electrodes. Uh, here they are shown in uh, some kind of a 3D projection. Uh, there's a characteristic trapping distance, R0. Uh, if, if these, if these uh, the top and bottom uh, electrodes are not perfectly aligned, they're not perfectly parallel, let's say we have some distance R0 plus delta R0 down here at this end, ions are trapped here in the center, and as we try to resonantly excite those ions for ejection, we're going to be exciting a different mass over here than we are over here. Uh, and that can be seen by these equations here. <clears throat> Getting a slightly different mass over on this side, and that's going to degrade our mass resolution. Uh, just th this is maybe a, an oversimplified uh, case study here, but if we are trying to get a mass resolution, say, of 1,000, uh, we can have no worse than one part per 1,000 alignment of the, of the electrodes. Uh, if we have a full-size device with a one centimeter R0 characteristic trapping radius, a five micron deviation is going to be just fine. But if we try to go down to one millimeter or even a tenth of a millimeter spacing between these electrodes, now those, those dimensions get, uh, get quite a bit smaller and more difficult to achieve. We have the same problem if we're using arrays. Uh, arrays of quadruple ion traps, every trap in the array has to be identical if you're intending to look at the same mass with each, with, with each trap. Uh, variations along the array are going to mess up your mass resolution. So this, I think, is fundamentally the, the trade-off between sensitivity and resolution as we miniaturize ion traps. One of the approaches that we've looked at uh, to overcome this problem is by using uh, lithographically patterned plates to make the electric fields for trapping ions. And the way we do that, starting out with two planar substrates, and then we pattern onto the inside or facing surfaces of these plates a series of electrodes. And we can pattern them very accurately in two dimensions. And if this is a, a, a planar surface, we, we have very good control over over, uh, over the height of these features, and so they can be patterned very accurately. Uh, we can select the correct electric potentials to, to apply to each of these electrodes. This will be a different RF amplitude. Uh, by applying the, the correct amplitudes of RF to each of these electrodes, we can get the correct shape of electric field in the space between these plates. And here we have uh, an example of a quadruple ion trap plate. Uh, two such plates put together would make a quadruple ion trap. And then over here, a linear ion trap plate. And again, two of those would make a linear ion trap. Uh, we're using standard microfabrication techniques to make these plates, um, starting out with an aluminum oxide substrate. This will be polished uh, down to tens of nanometers in flatness and planarity. Uh, and that's, that's a, a fairly standard value in the, in the microfabrication industry. Um, we use laser drilling for the holes, uh, holes for mounting holes for the ion ejection, and also holes that connect between the front and back side for electrical connections, these, these uh, vias here. Uh, we can pattern electrodes on the top and on the bottom. Uh, we can fill these vias with, with uh, gold, gold tungsten alloy uh, to give electrical connection. And then finally, putting a germanium layer on top. Uh, that reduces charge buildup on what is otherwise an insulating surface where it's not patterned with metal and also evens out the electric uh, potentials between the rings. This is a, a close-up here of one of our plates from a few years ago, and you can see the individual rings here. There are 24 rings uh, visible through that germanium layer. Uh, on the back side of this, we have uh, contact pads that contact a printed circuit board onto which we've soldered uh, capacitors, uh, basically a capacitive voltage divider to get the correct voltage on each, uh, on each of those. 
And uh, I've shown this data before, but just to, just to, uh, to reiterate this, this, this design works quite well. We're able to get very good mass resolution. Um, we have here a, a, a Z-naught, which is the half spacing between the plates of two millimeters, uh, RF in the hundreds of volts range, 1.2 megahertz, and we're, we're doing dipole resonant ejection on these. Uh, and this is just uh, showing what it looks like as it's assembled and wired up uh, in the sitting inside of its vacuum chamber with the vacuum chamber removed. Um, a few years ago, we also introduced a linear ion trap uh, using two plates, the, the same approach here. So we have, instead of a, a hole for ion ejection, we have a slit that's, that's cut into the uh, ceramic. Th this was the, uh, the first design that we made. And uh, after we broke a few of these, we realized that uh, there's not very much material left here on the ends, uh, preventing it from simply snapping in half. And so a later redesign uh, which I don't have a photograph of here, but, but uh, showing here uh, a later design has a shorter slit, uh, still covering most of this range, but uh, a little bit stronger on the outsides. Uh, this shows how we mount them just using sapphire balls. And then the printed circuit board on the back uh, that has the capacitors mounted onto it up here, and then the wires that go out to the power supply. Th this is not the power supply. This is just for size comparison. Um, we have a, a set of electrodes here. There are five wires here in the middle that uh, are used to create the trapping fields. And uh, we're able to get fairly good performance on this device. Uh, we've also recently uh, demonstrated that we can simply by, w w with the exact same plates, just moving them closer together and changing nothing but the capacitor values, it, it still works as a mass analyzer. And we've been able to get this to work uh, with, with uh, r naught or, or z naught, I guess, now less than a millimeter still getting fairly good performance. Um, this, this, I guess, uh, amounts to a, a high aspect ratio linear ion trap. We've, we've kept this dimension out here fairly long. Uh, these are uh, on the order of 50, 50 millimeters or so, um, whatever the length of the battery is, I guess. <clears throat> so the, the trapping dimension, the characteristic trapping dimension is now very small compared with the length of the device. One of the advantages of doing that is that we can trap a fairly long chain or long region, I guess, of ions while still having some of the advantages of running at higher pressure, lower power that we get from a, a small trapping dimension. On the other hand, um, we have found that as we, as we change the voltage that we put on these end bars, uh, we, we, we put a DC voltage here and that is, is to keep the ions from leaking out the sides. Th this has the same effect as the end plates uh, in the rectilinear trap or the, the end lenses, I guess, in a linear ion trap. Uh, if we have a fairly small voltage on these bars here, the ions can spread out over a fairly, fairly, uh, large, fairly long distance within the device. Uh, as we increase that voltage, we squeeze them more to the center. Uh, we've been using a small detector, and if we do this and squeeze them to the center, we actually get more signal, but we start to see some space charge effects, uh, and, and with, with, with extreme voltages on these, on these sides, many tens of volts, we get space charge effects. So there's again a trade-off here between wanting to have a large trapping volume and, and help with the sensitivity issue by having a large number of ions and being able to squeeze them all together to get them down into a small detector. Um, so one of the options is just to take ions coming out like this and use, uh, use additional ion optics or focusing elements to, to push them down, focus them down onto a detector. Uh, another option uh, would be to use curved plates. Um, we don't want to do that. Uh, those would be very difficult to work with. And then maybe a third option would be to use something that has a curved trapping region, uh, maybe something akin to the C-trap that uh, is used to inject ions onto an orbit trap mass spectrometer, uh, something that has curvature so that as the ions are ejected, they all naturally converge towards a point at the center. So and I, I mentioned the toroidal trap here. That may not be familiar to everybody. Uh, this is a toroidal ion trap, uh, and it's been around for about 12 years from, from Steve Lammert. Um, if you take a, a quadrupole cross-section and rotate it about an axis right to the center here, you get the conventional quadrupole ion trap that's uh, been around for, for decades. On the other hand, if you rotate this cross-section about an axis that's outside of the trapping center, say out here, now you have a toroidal ion trap. You have instead of three electrodes, now four electrodes, one at the center, one on the outside, one on the top and one on the, on the bottom. These electrodes have a little bit more complex shape, but your ions are now trapped in a ring instead of at just a single spheroidal volume at the center. 
So you dramatically increase the number of ions that you can contain. Um, in the uh, original version of this, ions are ejected axially, which would be out in this direction. Uh, and so you end up having essentially a, a, a um, cylindrical surface of ions coming out in both directions. Uh, Torian, uh, which is a company that's not too far away from my university, has a portable GCMS system that's based on this device, uh, the, the, uh, the toroidal ion trap. And they've got a, a, a smaller, a miniaturized version of that toroidal ion trap made using uh, conventional curved uh, hyperbolic metal electrodes. This is a, just a photograph showing that device. Well, so a toroidal ion trap has, a, has the hyperbolic electrodes and it's a fairly complex geometry. If you look at the other ion traps, um, simplifications in the electrode geometry have been keys to miniaturization. And we've seen already this afternoon a cylindrical ion trap uh, from, from David's presentation and then uh, Professor Cooks talked about a rectilinear ion trap. Uh, the cylindrical ion trap is a simplified electrode geometry from the quadrupole ion trap. If you, if you take these electrodes and approximate them as cylindrical and planar surfaces, you get this device. The electric fields inside are almost the same, and they work fairly well. Uh, again, with the linear ion trap, instead of having hyperbolic cross-section rods, you, you, you approximate those as flat surfaces. Uh, you get something that's much easier to produce in the rectilinear ion trap. So with the toroidal ion trap, is there a way that we can simplify these electrodes? and still retain the, the capabilities, but something that would be much easier to produce. And these, these question marks, unlike uh, the, the previous presentation, these are intended to be here. So before, before we answer that question, uh, one important thing to look at is there, there's an interesting asymmetry in the toroidal ion trap. Uh, if we take the axis of rotation and the traditional quadrupole uh, cross-section here and rotate that, we're, we would call this a symmetric design, a, a symmetric toroidal ion trap. Um, this turns out not to work very well. You have to skew the geometry a little bit with this asymmetric design, basically flattening out the inner electrode and, and uh, sharpening up the one on the outside. Uh, you can see a, an illustration of this here from Steve Lambert's original paper. The reason for this, or at least one, one way of looking at it, if you have an ion here that's at your trapping center, that ion is able to see a larger, or it's able to see a small solid angle of this central electrode compared with a very large solid angle of this outer electrode. You can see here the, the angle at which it looks at this central electrode is very small and it's basically surrounded by the large outer electrode. And so by widening this inner electrode and, and sharpening up the outer electrode, essentially we're, we're evening it out a little bit. So it's able to see both electrodes a little bit more evenly. Um, that may not be a rigorous, a rigorous way of looking at the problem, but, but it, it illustrates the point that there has to be this, this uh, asymmetry in the device for it to work. So how can we in incorporate this kind of asymmetry in a device that's made with, uh, with cylindrical or planar electrodes? Um, this is the device that we've come up with for that. Uh, this is our trapping region here, and we have our central electrode, which is uh, basically extends beyond the... Uh, beyond the trapping region itself, out as far as we wish. The outer electrode here, which is fairly small, and then we have the RF. This is now replacing the, uh, the top and bottom plates, or top and bottom electrodes. Uh, and so we create this trapping region in here. Um, another thing that we're, we're doing with this is that instead of axial ejection of the ions, uh, we are able to eject them in towards the center. We put our detector in here. Uh, we can trap a, a fairly large ring of ions and eject all these ions into the center of the device. Uh, so this, this uh, asymmetric overlap by having a larger inner electrode and a, a thinner outer one form, performs the same function as the asymmetry that was shown in the previous toroidal ion trap. Uh, these again are, are easier surfaces to machine uh, and instead of doing axial ejection we're doing radial ejection into the center. So basically all the ions are converging onto a single point right here at the center of our device. Uh, making it so that we can use a small detector and there may be other options for detection besides an electron multiplier. Uh, what we have here is a, a conversion dynode. The ions come up and hit that and then down into the, into the neck of the detector. Um, something else that we've, uh, we've observed in simulations and it, it's hard to verify in an experiment, but we, we think we're also doing this as well, uh, is that all the ions are injected towards the center. We have none that are going out when they're being resonantly excited uh, just because of the shape of the fields here. So. Um, in, in contrast to linear ion traps where typically your ions go out both sides 
and uh, you either put two detectors or you lose half of your ions. In this case, every ion that is in the trap gets to the center of the trap at the same point, just at different times. Oh, I guess I highlighted the trapping region there. It's always nice when there's a little surprise in the talk. Okay, so the first generation prototype of this device, um, this is a fairly large uh, looking device. We have essentially decoupled the major radius and the minor radius of, of the toroid. Uh, this would be the, the major radius, the distance between the very center out to the trapping region, and then the minor radius is this R0 uh, characteristic trapping region, uh, characteristic trapping radius, I'm sorry. Uh, we, can, we, can make, uh, we can make the device as large as we want and still have a fairly small, uh, fairly small trapping dimensions. Uh, essentially what this is is a, is a uh, high aspect ratio trap curved around on itself. Uh, so our minor radius on this first generation prototype is 6 millimeters, uh, major radius of 30 millimeters uh, using uh, very typical conditions. We mapped out the stability diagram of this. Uh, since we couldn't find anything published on a toroidal ion trap. Um, it looks a little bit like a linear ion trap, which would be uh, symmetric at this point, except that it comes down just a little bit where these, where these uh, radial and axial instability lines intersect. Uh, and due to uh, limitations of our power supply, we couldn't get up here or down there, but, but the rest of these points seem to be uh, in very good agreement. Uh, this asymmetry right here is probably due either to uh, the electrode spacing, which is a little bit different, uh, between our, our vertical and, and horizontal electrodes, or uh, probably the, the stronger reason for this is that we have the curvature of the trapping region. So this is not exactly a linear ion trap, and we wouldn't expect it to behave exactly like that, but it, but it behaves very similarly. Uh, interestingly, this, uh, this shape is also seen on the rectilinear ion trap when they're using differences in the X and Y uh, dimensions. What this means is that if we, uh, if we have ions in here and do simply a boundary ejection scan, uh, ramp them out this direction, they come out in the radial direction anyway, rather than the axial direction. We've uh, done some experiments where we change the spacing of these electrodes. Uh, here on the left, we see the same sort of experiment on a cylindrical ion trap. Simply by moving the top and bottom end caps in or out, we change what the field shape looks like inside the device. Uh, and this has been done to optimize performance on a cylindrical ion trap. Uh, we did the same thing here just by changing the spacing of these two RF electrodes to uh, see what the optimal spacing is for the uh, cylindrical electrode toroidal ion trap. We need a shorter name for that. Um, and looking at what the different uh, higher order terms are and plotting those as a function of the RF electrode separation, we see that we have some hexapole, octopole, and decapole components of this. Uh, that hexapole component is not normally seen in, in ion traps that have uh, symmetry, uh, so a quadrupole or a cylindrical ion trap or even, a, I suppose, a, a rectilinear ion trap, you don't usually see that hexapole component. But because of the curvature and the way ours is, we, we always have that hexapole component. Uh, it actually performs an important function, which is that that's the term that is making all the ions ejected towards the center and then that are going outside. Uh, octopole and, and decapole are common in, in all traps. Um, we weren't sure exactly what uh, combination of these fields we wanted, so we tried the experiment. Uh, we tried different scan functions, a forward scan. This was actually a mass selective instability scan, just running them into the boundary of the stability diagram. And then a reverse scan, which was a resonance ejection, so uh, ramping down the RF amplitude as we applied a resonance ejection signal. Um, and then changing the octopole with the accompanying change in hexapole and dodecapole on other fields. Uh, and in all cases, it works fairly well, but with the 0.5% octopole, we see the best mass resolution. Uh, I'm not sure if the, the vertical axes here are exactly, uh, exactly correspond to one another or not. Uh, but we're getting very good mass resolution here for both the forward and the reverse scans. And that was a little bit of a surprise as well. Uh, we expected more of a difference between forward and reverse. But in each of these cases, between the forward and reverse scans, the differences are not that great. And then we have a few scans of some other common organic compounds just to show that it, toluene is not just a fluke. It is our favorite compound to run, but it works on some other compounds as well. So options for miniaturization of this device. Um, conventional machining, where we, we've made a device that goes down with R-naught down to about two millimeters, and that's about as far as we can go with, with 
uh, pieces of metal that are cut in traditional machining techniques. Uh, we've also now made a device that's using sheet metal and uh, sheet Teflon and sheet capped on film as insulators. These, these uh, sheet metals are available with very good, uh, very good uniformity of thickness and they're fairly inexpensive and we can cut them with, with uh, laser or with wire EDM. Well, I don't do it, but the machine shop does that. And we can get down uh, smaller size scales on those. Uh, this device seems like it's going to be uh, amenable to that kind, of, that kind of miniaturization with sheet materials. And then this may also work with a multi-layer microfabrication. I'm careful not to go to the one micron again, uh, but we'll, we'll see how far we can go with that. Um, an important uh, aspect of this is that we can keep the major radius fairly large, so that the major radius here while making the minor radius small and, and make a very high aspect ratio device so we can retain a high trapping capacity while having a very small characteristic trapping radius. Um, the, the positioning of this uh, central electrode is, uh, is very important and we can position several detectors on the inside and look and see how that uh, positioning changes as we piezoelectrically move it around and look at different masses coming out uh, and use that for alignment purposes. Um, it's good to have a detector that's going to be shielded away from our RF plates so we can, we can all of this here is grounded and that uh, makes it a little bit low, lower noise for detection. Uh, a challenge with, with uh, making this too small is that it's hard to get electrons in, it's hard to get ions in when, when the R-naught value gets too small. And so the, the most recent version of this that we're working on has an integrated ion guide which you can see here. This is basically the, the uh, toroidal ion trap made with cylindr cylindrical electrodes, but we also have a, uh, an ion guide that's in integrated tangentially onto this device. Uh, put the RF on these, on these brown electrodes. This, this green will be our tickle, and then the, the uh, detector would go here in the center. Uh, we can position an ion gate out here and maybe use this for uh, external ionization, uh, allow ions to be brought in from the outside. Uh, we can also use a slit here to make ions with an electron gun that would be positioned directly over that slit. And this just uh, maybe is an easier way to see some of that. Ions are brought in here. We're, we're looking at ways of cutting them off or pushing them in through this point. Th this joint here has been a bit of a headache. Uh, but if we can get them in, get them in and then eject them all towards a, an ion detector that would be located at the very center of the device. Uh, so we can bring ions, a, a fairly large number of ions from a large trapping region to bring them all to a single point at the center for, for better detection. Uh, again, we have the same features as the other uh, toroidal ion trap, which is that all the ions are ejected to the center. Um, we we uh, retain the large trapping capacity. We can adjust the major and minor, minor radii independently. Um, the detector is actually located here, which is a fairly, fairly large distance away from the RF, and that's going to help with noise. Uh, this, this is a device that may work with external or internal ionization and maybe is easy to in integrate with a GC, which is one of the directions that we're looking at. Now, the, uh, the title of my talk was Converging Ion Traps for Miniaturized Mass Spectrometry. And uh, just to maybe uh, back up and take a bit broader view, there are a lot of different groups and a lot of companies that are working on this problem. Um, and I, a lot of you are here. Uh, I think that we have a number of different variables that go into a small mass spectrometer. And uh, it's not just about uh, new fabrication, smaller, more, more precision, which is something that I've worked on, novel ion traps, again. But we also have uh, such things as new ionization techniques, and we've, we've heard some of that already today. Uh, tandem capabilities, sampling selectivity, and of course there are always uh, other things going on. Uh, improvements in detectors, vacuums, smaller pumps. Uh, smaller electronics and improvements in battery technology. All these things, I think, converge onto our field of miniaturized and portable mass spectrometry, but I think that this is, this is a set of variables that is converging. I, I think that we are seeing now some smaller instruments, and I think that we're going to continue to see them uh, smaller in the years to come. And so with that, uh, let me emphasize the people that have done the work, uh, my research group and uh, former members of my research group, and the collaborators that I've worked with on this, and thank you for your attention. I don't have anything in the back to see, but you can ask questions. My question was about the, um, you mentioned then that the uh, asymmetry, you needed to introduce an asymmetry to increase the angle of the INCs with the electrodes. 
Was that done experimentally by trial and error, or was that computed? Um, we did a lot of simulations first. The, so the question is uh, whether or not we uh, experimentally figured out or if we calculated in advance the asymmetry of electrodes, right? Yep. Okay, so the, the shape of the electrodes, we, we worked this out quite a bit first using Simion. Uh, and then we, we, we kept open some variables such as the spacing of the electrodes, uh, which we, we did experimentally. But we, we set up the experiment with the intention that those would be varied. And it agreed? It agreed, yes. We, we've, we've seen some uh, some hiccups in the theory when it when it applies to toroidal ion traps. The uh, the uh, with the Laplace equation and the higher order multipoles and and that's not going to be an interesting topic to discuss. But there are there are some interesting things that are going on that that don't quite make sense. But yeah, uh, you talk about miniaturization uh, ever since uh, My question uh, have changed. Tolerance to uh, vacuum, is it significant help uh, work for higher pressure conditions? So the question is with respect to miniaturization, whether as we miniaturize the mass analyzer, we're seeing uh, higher operating pressures that we can run at. Is that right? Yes. Um, we've, seen, we've seen higher pressures that we're running at. We, uh, these smaller traps, we run at about 10 millitor, whereas, and that's for the optimal performance, whether, whereas one millitor to two millitor is what we were doing for some of the larger devices, and I guess that's consistent with commercial instruments. So we are seeing some increase in the pressure, but it's not a huge increase. I think that uh, from a theoretical standpoint, it should scale inversely with the trapping dimension, so R0. As it goes down by an order of magnitude, we should expect to see the pressure go up by an order of magnitude. So you can um, today work in 10 millitors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what about ions detection? This, uh, you have no ability electron multiplier in this case? So the question is how high the electron multipliers can go in pressure before they have problems. Yeah. Yeah. That's still a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that there are some improvements in that, in that area, and it would be nice to see ion detectors that work at atmospheric pressure if anybody has a way to do that. Yes? How much does the ion guide disturb the field in the traps? Um, on, on this particular trap here, uh, I guess I'll have to use the laser, uh, there is some disturbance here, and we've actually blocked off the pathway to the ion detector, so no ions will get there from right in here. Uh, it, do, it does uh, significantly perturb it for mass analysis purposes, but the ions are still able to get in. We've also looked at just blocking it off altogether so that it's not completely all the way around, but uh, the ions would have kind of a turnaround point right here. And that's, another, that's another way of doing this. It, it, it definitely is a perturbation, though. Pulse gridding, yeah, yeah, some kind of a grid or just a little thing sticking in that pulses. So with surface charging, I think this only applies to the insulating surfaces. Yeah, we haven't. Uh, we haven't addressed that question yet, but it may be an issue. Uh, surface charging, which, which seems to be very closely associated with contamination and, and buildup of residue on the, on the traps. So the cardinal one without the iron guide, how, how did you ionize the, I guess you do the internal ionization, right? Yeah, this, uh, this cylindrical trap here, we're, we're using uh, internal ionization, and there is a, uh, Somewhere back here, an electron gun that uh, maybe is not very visible here, but there's a small electron gun mounted on the side, uh, so and that's you where. Have a slit on the side, or you do come in? Yeah, there's a, a slit right here, so we bring our electrons in through that slit, and this is one of the things that's going to be challenging to make this a lot smaller. Uh, we've we've uh, we've got a version now where this this slit occupies most of this electrode, which again perturbs the electric field, and we've blocked off access to the detector where the where the electron gun is shooting in. Uh, but that's one of the reasons that we want to go to the, the integrated ion guide so we can get away from having to have a slit there with an electron gun. Yes? Are you raising the RF frequency as you shrink it down? The question is, are we raising the RF frequency as we shrink this down? We've tried to raise it. It, it becomes challenging, as you know. Uh, you're, you're working on our, on our RF power supply. Uh, we've been able to get this up to about 3.5 megahertz. Uh, works. We, we'd like to go a little bit higher than that. Um, We'd like to go up to five and, and, and beyond that, but. Uh, uh, 
I'm sorry? We've never had any problem with discharge. Uh, we've, we've just had limitations with how high the power, power supplies can go, but we also don't want to be putting in thousands of volts. That, that, that's not, that doesn't lend itself to a, to a miniaturized instrument. So we'd like, to get, we'd like to get these voltages down, but we'd like to not get them any higher. Thank you very much.